uh, to see how climate can uh, uh, are driving the sowing window. Uh, you see here the same plant composition, which is adapted mainly to the continental and the mild uh, continental Atlantic area. You see here the months. I don't know why it's changing the the screen is uh, this letter, but doesn't matter. And um, you see that the continental, which is continental, cold continental, the sowing window is in summer. If you go down to the Mediterranean, the sowing window is shifting to end summer, being of the autumn, end of the autumn. So the same plant's composition, if you want to use in this area, as a different, completely different sowing window. Uh, in fact, you use lolium perenne here in October, November. You don't use in uh, May, June, July. If you make an uh, uh, overseeding in the mountains, in a ski slope, they do every year for keeping the, uh, the con erosion control. They do in uh, after snow, of course. So it means June, July, the season is very short in high elevation. So they have to use uh, this type of plants and the sowing windows is here. In our area where I'm working, it's uh, this. We have two sowing windows. We we cut. We stop the sowing window very early. Why? Because what is often happening uh, is uh, more and more is that you have some uh, heat wave in May, and if if your plants are just germinating, are gone. Doesn't matter if you keep water or whatever, but the temperature is uh, killing a lot of plants, and disease are also coming. So this. Uh, window is uh, op is open. There is no sowing here in this time of the year because of the critical condition you can get in a very early stage. Uh, keep in mind that <coughs> there is one optimum sowing window also for this plant, which can be very very narrow. Uh, based on our on my experience in this climate, this the ideal sowing window is a matter of two three weeks a year no more and is located between the end of august and the first two three weeks of september max that's it uh, as stronger is the climate this window is getting more and more narrow if you have a mild climate like the atlantic as i said before you go into uk they make overseed in uh, June, July, November, December, doesn't matter. But when the climate has strong fluctuation mm -hmm. through the years and within the year also, the sowing window is very, very narrow. And I say it's a matter of 20, 30 days max. But if you think to wheat, area per area is almost the same. So the sowing window in my area of wheat is also a matter of four weeks. Uh, middle of October, middle of November, no before, no later. It's it before the plants are growing too much, it's later they are entering into the winter in a very uh, small stage, very sensitive to the, to the cold, to the frost. And uh, the same for other crops. So because it's a grass, uh, there's a big discussion eh, with uh, end users, with green keeper. No, but I want to see, okay, you want to see green now. It's, uh, now we are in May, the temperature tomorrow can be 30 degrees and uh, the plants yeah, will germinate maybe or will be killed immediately by soil borne pathogens. You don't see and then you get crazy question, what, where are the pathogens coming from? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> so uh, in the soil. So that's uh, about the sowing window and uh, if you go to this um, very widely used uh, plants population, you see as well the same system. <clears throat> so don't underestimate the power of the sewing window. An ideal sewing window is the, is the key start of every plant's community. For another reason I described before, we are working here with plants population. So when I told you before that uh, Lolium perenne has, for instance, five days for germinating in ideal conditions, and poa pratensi has uh, 12 days for germinating in ideal condition. If the temperature is dropping, lolium perenne will take 10 days, and poa pratensi 30 days. 
Be why? Because all those plants are germinating under a specific growing degree days. So lolium is about 120, between 100 and 130 days, the growing degree days, over five degrees for the germination. Poa has a much higher uh, growing degree days demand. Therefore, when the temperature is growing, you reach the growing degree days much later or, or never even. So if you are going ahead in the season and uh, every day you go into the sum, uh, autumn and winter, the temperature are dropping and the, the useful degrees are less and less. Therefore, you can end, uh, end up with a population of only one species. And you say, ah, but they use two in the mix. Yes, but you, you, may, you may the obvious the seeding very late one species had a sufficient growing degree days and the other did not. And as this issue is very hot, uh, many uh, breeders are looking to, to the growing degree days demand within the species. And we found also there wide variation in the species, something about 30, 40 degrees variation. So you think that to, to achieve uh, 10 degrees when the temperature is, is uh, or uh, 40 degrees when the temperature is between 5 and 8 takes many days you know so that's a key factor for the overseeding question and uh, breeders are looking to plants that can germinate by using the very low temperature between 3 4 and 7 8 degrees temperature that are not useful for many other plants <coughs> so that's about the sowing window. So I don't go in details, but that's the situation. And the same is for the high temperatures. Um, I move from the plant to the water now, and then to the nutrition. Uh, because we are in I5, we have to talk about nutrition, huh? <laughs> of course. <laughs> and uh, what is the when you talk with uh, a greenkeeper and user, they think immediately to irrigation. We have to look to the water management, which is a different question of, the, of irrigation. Water management means how do they manage the water? Do I trust uh, to the rainfall or not? They don't think that because you are, you are in Israel and that's uh, okay. To keep green, you need irrigation also with the warm season grasses, I guess. They cannot stay green without uh, irrigation in this area. But if you move a bit north, eh, uh, irrigation is a question mark. But are we talking about drought or about heat or about both? So I show some uh, researchers, these are papers, published researchers, so you see different uh, uh, relative water content in the tall fescue leaves. Those are plants growing in uh, perfect condition, no water stress, no heat stress. These are plant uh, with, uh, um, this is a plant with heat and water stress. This is a plant with no heat and water stress. This is a plant with heat and no water stress. So you see, when you combine the two factors, you have the critical, very critical condition in 18 days after the stress starts. So you can have a drought also in the winter or when temperature is low. And you can have the other way around. So the two factors are, I mean, moving the plants uh, in, different, uh, in different pathways. So this is Poa pratensis, another very widely used species. You see, when you have the two factors combined, the drop is very dramatic. But if you have only heat, there is uh, nothing happening. So sometimes we are worried about, about uh, drought because it's hot. But it's a different issue. It can be very hot, but with uh, enough water in the soil. And so we have to look at uh, the water level, and then we can understand if the plants will suffer about heat and hot, or only one factor 
which is in the case of poor proteins not limiting at all the growth. So you can have high temperature and you don't with no, without water stress and you have a very relaxed growth of the plants. So this is a, a, a simple, uh, I'll share down the, by this department in uh, Bali, which is uh, yeah, here, climatically very similar to Israel, 300 millimeters a year, drought season from uh, March to October. And then what they did, uh, this, per this guy here, he was uh, supplying uh, full irrigation or reducing the irrigation. So you see 100% of the evapotranspiration or 50% of the evapotranspiration. As you see here, Bermuda, 100 or 50, does not matter. No changes. So you can easily supply 50. If you want to see water stress, maybe you have to go down to 25% of the evapotranspiration. Deficit. Transpiration with a uh, <coughs> minus uh, precipitation. But there were no precipitation, so it's only evapotranspiration. But if you go to the cool season, you see this plant is suffering already in June, although you supply 100% of the evapotranspiration. So that's the heat factor, not the water stress. But this species, which is uh, I described before, is used in the north as well as in the south, is keeping quite a good uh, canopy and, and uh, greenness and stability, also under very dramatically reduced water level. It means the adaptation to the drought of this species is very wide. And this is a cool season type, like this one. So you see a big drop, and if I reduce the water of this lolium perenne, down to 40% of density, uh, from 100 to 40. And then slowly recovering, maybe it could recover October, November, but you have a big uh, window in a, with a very low plant density. Also, if you uh, supply the water, because as we say before, the limiting factor is the temperature, it's not only the water. So those are the curves. So you see the uh, at uh, R2, 50% of water requirement. So you see the Bermuda, the tall fescue, the lolium, and the poa collapse. <coughs> so these are uh, those are our tests we did uh, already 10 years ago under different uh, water conditions to study both the plant reaction and then the uh, recovery after the stress. We use different uh, systems, and I show just some picture to see here was 2003 dramatic drive for the all over Europe uh, with a water deficit of about 400 millimeters in the four uh, central months of the summer. You see here never irrigated. You may say, okay, it's died, everything uh, is gone. So this is uh, summer and August 2003. This is end September 2003 with no with no irrigation. So you see plants can recover. So how long was here uh, critical conditions? Maybe six, eight weeks. And you see another effect, year effect. So this is a, uh, sorry, uh, this is a summer effect. And then if you go to the year effect, that's also interesting. Year after, it was the same area in the same day. So you see climatic, how those plants can adapt and cope with different uh, fluctuations. So recover after severe stress and be completely green and closed and dense the year after only because of mild summer. So seasonal effect and year effect. <coughs> those ability is because the plants are perennial. So, uh, I can present many slides about the water, so but uh, I, I skip it. It's uh, maybe uh, you have the presentation, then uh, people, uh, if one day can read it. Uh, I go ahead to general uh, sentences based on data, of course. Uh, so this is the water consumption, the water use efficiency 
in millimeter per day of different key species. So you can go from four millimeter up to 10 millimeter per day. So 10 liter square meter to keep the best condition. And, uh, and you see through the year, the fact, the variation uh, bit, uh, of the warm season grasses, the, the, the light uh, blue and the cool season grasses. So uh, the efficiency in uh, the use of water uh, of C4 plants it's much, is much higher than the C3. Because the, myo the biomass is the same. So it has to do with the efficiency. So the biomass is the same. The dry matter is the same. So the water content in the mass is the same. It has to do the water transpirated. There is a nice paper published by uh, Israeli researchers recently about the role of the hair of the leaves in the efficiency of the use of the water. And those plants, the Bermuda types, all those plants have hair on the surface of the leaves. It looks like this hair is uh, capable to catch uh, the night humidity and uh, to keep a special uh, mini environment with a uh, high uh, pressure, uh, how do you call it? Uh, vapor, steam, um, vapor, pressure vapor pressure deficit. It's different on a narrow, a narrow band over, over the leaves. That's why those plants are uh, transpirating less than the others. But the difference is really dramatic. So you talk about liter per day. So the main question uh, are this one for the growers. So is the water deficit happening every year in every location? Are the species similar? And are the cultivars different within the species? This is another factor that uh, uh, is getting under investigation to see if there is variation within the species, not only between the species. It looks like, yes, can be a large variation in uh, adaptation to the drought. So you can select varieties according with the drought resistance as well typical uh, meteor station. So we did some tests also, and you see here, we call uh, days after stress start, different species. You see quality three means very bad. How many days it takes before a plant goes into this critical condition? So it can happen in 15 days or in 35 days. You see here, within a species can happen in 30 days or in 36 and here in uh, 12 days or in 35 days the same species it's not surprising me because this species is apomitic so it is uh, every variety is like uh, a clone is a is a genetically is a uh, closed family this plant is not crossing easily so that's why the drought is opening a very wide range of uh, variation in the drought resistance here and not here. So it's three times longer here, eh? this variety before the variety shows the stress signals. So you can imagine back, how can you play with the plants in this way? With irrigation, without <coughs> irrigation, how the population can shift in one direction or the other, just based on this specific characteristics, not the color, not the final leaves, come on not these uh, things, but really hardware of the plants is in these characteristics. And this is tall fescue, which is a very strong adapted, as we have seen before also in the research done by us and done by other people around the world. But you see here, it take uh, 70 days before the plants can show symptoms of drought. But here the drought is no rain at all. So it's two and a half months with no any drop of water in summertime and here is 50 days so to show shortly that uh, this world inside has a still a wide potential on the plants point of view <coughs> and this is uh, one of the methods we use uh, during year so you see here 
uh, circles with the sprinklers in the middle. Of course, the sprinklers gives a lot of water close, less water on the end. So we, we split in uh, rings, you know, the, the plots, and then you can see going from the center to the end, the variation of the green during uh, over summer. And then we combine with fertilizer as well to study how fertilizers can delay the stress symptoms. And then we saw something, especially in the potassium, that can really delay, which is well known, but uh, we demonstrated again that uh, it's, a, it's a tool for delay of about 10, 15 days, no more, because when the stress is stress, no any nu nu nutrients can do anything. So there is a lack of water, and that is the key factor. So, <clears throat> and then again, some variation uh, with, uh, between the varieties uh, and so on. <coughs> so, this is a you know, irrigation system in Turkey, a grower. And, uh, and we have some troubles here uh, with the water infiltration. But this is the opposite. Uh, travels you know of the <laughs> of the irrigation so but we have to keep in mind that the frequency and quantity of irrigation has to uh, as an impact of all these factors the turf grass performances the competition of the other species uh, it's funny to see poano in israel for me very funny poano is native of the north european area or high elevation you know, Poanua has another species, which is Poa Supina, you find above, above 2,000 meters on the sea level in the Alps. So it's funny to see in Israel. I ask you, how can you keep green these plants? It's suffering three days of drought, it's gone. It means your irrigation program is completely wrong because you can keep green a plant that have a two millimeter, a two centimeter roots, very high transpiration, because needs to cool down, and then you keep green. So look to your program, uh, water program, because then you are keeping green a plant that should not be at all green in this area, even should not exist in this area. So you can keep alive plants that are not, <laughs> I mean, uh, native at all, they cannot cope with the climatic conditions. Then you have uh, impact of organic matter evolution, depending on the, on the uh, irrigation program, the disease, of course, and floristic composition. You can really drive, as I showed before, <coughs> the flora in one direction or into another direction. <coughs> and of course, costs and organizations, because uh, water is, uh, is energy, is water, is pipes, is, uh, and so on. So the trend is to reduce as much as possible the impact, the use of the water everywhere. Uh, the, the investment for irrigation is very heavy. The maintenance of the irrigation system is also very heavy. And those are costs that you have anyway. Plus you have the water and the energy. And plus all the feedbacks generated by the wrong irrigation system. I had uh, one day a conversation with a Toro guy. Toro is the, one of the largest worldwide uh, uh, irrigation uh, company for turf grass, not only. And uh, he asked me, yeah, you have a, a software, of course, you have a system. Uh, yes, yes, we do. Yeah, how do you set up the system? Yeah, we say, okay, April, we say four, May five, June six, and the rain, the rain, uh, okay. So we did a test and we, could, uh, we saw that you can reduce 50% of the irrigation just by keeping into account the rainfall. Immediately drop down the irrigation of 50%. Then if you use the right varieties, the right fertilizer, you can reduce another 50%. So it means you, you compare 100 with 25. Mm -hmm. At the end, in some area, you can completely skip the irrigation. And that makes a lot of advantages less weed, less disease, less annual grass, uh, less competition, less uh, shift in the plant's composition, the strong surviving, the strong plants will survive, the other are gone. <coughs> so there is a big challenge in the shift of the flora in the urban areas around the world now. So 
So it's a strong, uh, it's a strong argument. Few words about disease. <coughs> Just typical uh, disease, uh, you see rust, like in wheat. Resistant, non-resistant variety. <coughs> it's a matter of centimeter. So this is genetic background, 100%. Nothing to do with uh, maintenance or whatever. You see how you can uh, uh, select and uh, progress in the, in the plants by screening by disease, for diseases. This is pitium. Uh, you know where pitium is happening. I don't have to teach you. We have a specific uh, temperature range. <coughs> it's uh, often happening <coughs> because of the excess of nitrogen <coughs> and then excess of humidity on the leaves and the soil surface. <coughs> this is another typical disease on uh, uh, high quality grass, which is sclerotinia. You see the leaf symptom and the canopy symptom. <coughs> what we see now, especially with this disease, is that uh, it was uh, typical of autumn, but now it's happening also in spring. In the last years, we, there are many, uh, many uh, notes, many uh, remarks that uh, these diseases are happening not, not only in, in autumn, but also in spring. So the, it's changing really the situation. This fusarium, another important disease, uh, with uh, excess of nitrogen, excess of water, and temperature here, you see, spring and summer. This is the initial uh, damage, and this is uh, the end of the damage. This is rhizoctonia, which is a typical soil-borne pathogen, very, very heavy uh, in all, almost all species, in a high temperature, water excess, and nitrogen excess, available nitrogen, of course, nitrogen level in the soil. These are the small rings, and this is when the, 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 the disease is growing. <coughs> uh, this is a red thread, a typical nitrogen-lack disease. So this is the opposite. Plants suffering for a nitrogen deficiency, in this case. So easy to fight, no need to any fungicide. Just uh, good uh, nutrition, and that's gone. <coughs> this is rust on poa, a nice disease. Large difference between varieties, from very, very tolerant, almost not susceptible at all, to very susceptible. <coughs> uh, so, and then if you go to the go to the chart, you see the disease. How are through the year for the different species, and you see that in one moment you find many diseases, no one. So it doesn't make sense, uh, I mean, all the story of fungicide, it, it, it's nice, but you don't have to fight one thing. You have many uh, diseases at the same time. This is lolium, this is tall fescue. Also those information are available on the web. I think it's uh, Michigan State University producing this chart. <coughs> then you can see, you know, many things. So you have to keep in mind that in some countries, um, the green keepers, the main budget is dedicated to the fungicide. To the very high, in the very high quality turf grass, the main budget is fungicide. At the day, the fungicide use will stop. <coughs> that's uh, for many uh, area will be problematic to keep stable. So that's why I strongly repeating that uh, in front of us, we have uh, uh, in the f near future, the main vision should be in the shift of the plant's population. So species, varieties, and growing system. So we cannot live anymore with a system developed between the end of the 80s and uh, the last, until uh, the last five years ago. So we had a window of uh, 20 years where we were thinking, everybody was thinking, okay, more water, more fertilizer, nice variety, more machineries, we can do everything. Now we are on the wall and we have to 
bypass the situation or to cope with another st completely other strategies, which is going on from the breeding to the nutrition to the water and uh, maintenance and so on. Uh, so that's Bermuda, important here, and you see also Bermuda has diseases a lot, especially when it's humid. You have nematodes, and you have uh, general disease. Even here, the, the phytopathologists are not able to identify the species. They say Bermuda decline. What is decline? Yeah, it's a, you know it's a it's a decline. But uh, what is the, the the agent of this decline? <coughs> The last part is uh, dedicated to the nutrition. <coughs> uh, especially if uh, the maintenance is used to remove the clipping, the nutrition is another key factor. And if the use is intense, you cannot grow grass without nutrition. Uh, the grass demand is from about 50 kilo n per hectare per year for the very, uh, I mean, uh, kind plants like Pestuca ovina up to 400 kilo per hectare per year of Bermuda. So this is the range of uh, nitrogen demand. So you can grow Pestuca ovina without nitrogen. The rainfall nitrogen is enough. You move twice a year, and that's it but you cannot play on it. You cannot expect that it's dense all over the year. You cannot expect that it's green when it's needed to be green. It's there, it's stable, it's permanent. It's maybe controlling the soil erosion in a, in a nice uh, uh, grape uh, area. What it's doing, that's for that, for that it's used, but no more. When you go in a lawn, in a park, in a sport pitches, in a rugby or whatever, you need absolutely nutrition. But those factors are dri driving the nutrition as well. So the details are important, not general sentences. So we try to, we have tried in the years to define all the details that can uh, guide the, the nutrition choices. So some key factors are First, general NPK ratio. You go through literature and you find NPK is 1041, 1041.5, something like this. Max 2. But the, especially the nitrogen potassium ratio is varying dramatically through the year. So there is no need of potassium, uh, dramatic of potassium in the in the in the growth after summer i mean when the plants are greening up again there is no need of potassium at all in the contrary potassium can depress the plants growth but there is a more need of potassium in the critical seasons <coughs> i wrote here in a nitrogen demand can go from eight gram with a loan very easy loan family loan or uh, simple municipality areas or whatever, up to 40, 50 gram per square meter per year, which is equal to 400, 500 kilo N per year, which is quite heavy nutrition. Uh, if you ask to the greenkeeper of uh, Manchester United, Manchester City, say, oh, 50, 70 gram of nitrogen per square meter per year doesn't know how much nitrogen is losing to the soil profile, I think 50%, but this is what is using for keeping this high, very high standard quality. So where is high the demand? I wrote here, intense use winter sport pitches. They push in the winter to grow because of the use, but the plants <laughs> cannot grow too much because of the temperature. So there is a conflict. Or warm season grasses with very long growing season. So in an area where, uh, where Bermuda is never getting dormant, it's growing 
every day of the year or in a tropical area where the <coughs> temperature is fluctuating from 30 to 20 degrees the warm season grass can can grow every day of the year without any stop it's like banana you know what is the demand of ban potassium banana sky high eh? 1200 yeah very high so there is a season no maybe a bit uh, in some area on the border of banana winter summer but in the in the equatorial trips every day is the same eh? so that's uh, here also another factor is the partition through the season so we have to uh, focus more on nitrogen in, in active growing <coughs> season and more on potassium on the stress seasons so the ratio the general ratio is uh, is is this one but the ratio in the season season can vary and the number of application of oh, this i'm missing something here sorry is from two to three in the loans up to 12 is not one is 12 in the very high quality talk it means every month every three weeks fertilizers application so it's a wide world it's not one world other factors we can uh, uh, look at are uh, coated fraction and longevity per nutrient um, it's clear that if you are growing a grass in a in a sandy topsoil with low cationic exchange capacity with very high leaching uh, profile if you apply something you lose also especially in the early stages of the grass because the root system is not widely distributed therefore there is not capacity to catch the nutrients so nutrients the coated fraction can vary according with the nutrient with the substrate with the season if it's cold okay there is no need to coat more to protect the nutrients more because uh, you know the availability is getting slow water conditions is a is a excess of water irrigation or is a is a very precise accurate irrigation system in the number of applications if i decide to apply as we are testing now once a year i cannot apply fully soluble fertilizers and the day after i get 100 millimeters rain and i lose all my nutrients i have to protect the nutrients in order to get them available in the in the coming uh, eight or ten months so the coated fraction should be from medium to high for the nitrogen of course which is the most sensitive to the leaching low or very low even for uh, phosphate and uh, medium or very low coated fraction for the potassium which is uh, more catched by the soil system <coughs> the longevity can be one but also can be a mix of different longevity in order to I mean dilute the number of applications if i want to apply only once i cannot give uh, six month release fertilizer because in the first three months i don't get any nitrogen i have to combine it in order to have a ready available n and to have intermediate available n and in the long run also some nitrogen potassium looks different uh, sorry uh, uh, yeah potassium looks different because it's uh, it's uh, it's blocked by uh, the, the, the cationic same capacity therefore can be available although it's not coated it's not leached easily uh, mainly only in a very sandy uh, silica sandy substrate with low organic matter you have a leaching high leaching potential and this is uh, those are the the nutrient sources we have been working and we are working uh, in the last 12 years to find the right uh, plants nutrition system so this uh, combination is giving not an easy picture on how to fertilize when how much which types and so on but we have to arrive to a very you know uh, to some conclusion <laughs> so I put here some examples this is a typical I call it tropical wet when, ir when irrigated 
is a tropical wet climate. If I irrigate every day, although I'm in Mediterranean area, it's a tropical wet climate. The temperature is the, the tropical, the water is artificial. So you see here a uh, typical uh, year-long growing season, very long, February, November, so nine months. So this is port, teas and fireways, so medium high quality grass requirement, Bermuda. So you see how the, the many factors are now crossing, combining and, and driving the choices. So species, climate, use. Species, climate, use. <coughs> and then uh, it's an example. So the, the, the letter are total quant quantity of nutrients per square meter, quoted proportion and longevity. So you see here uh, the total uh, uh, nutrients per year, quite high, of course, is a sport with Bermuda, nine months growth, almost 350, 400 kilo N per hectare. Bermuda can eat a lot. Is a, is, a, is a heavy nitrogen eater plant. We did test by uh, distributing up to 400 kilo N in one shot. And uh, look to the plant reaction. The plants were shocked in the first uh, days, but then immediately started growing again in the full summer with uh, uncoated urea. So 800 kilo urea per hectare in one shot to a Bermuda canopy. So we had uh, some days of uh, you know, salinity or whatever, and then dramatic growth of the plants, producing high quantity of mass. So this is a plant that, that can really eat up to 400, 450 kilo N per year. So those are the suggestions in uh, January, March, June, August, October uh, of the application. The quantity and coated uh, material of course, uh, uh, short uh, coating here because uh, lower temperature, more longevity because of the high temperature. A four month release is a four months at 21 degrees, but it's not a four months anymore at 30 degrees. So the longevity is uh, strongly uh, connected with the temperature conditions. And then uh, before winter. So this is an example. Then I put another example in a subcontinental cold and subcontinental mild so over transition zone in transition zones of a sport so heavy used uh, grass like a stadio you see 30 uh, uh, 300 kilo n per hectare so 30 gram per square meter in uh, six applications so every two months so all the time two months release uh, and urea sometimes uh, uncoated potassium sometimes coated potassium and in the subcontinental uh, uh, tall fascium mixture, medium maintenance, four, three, and we are now studying the two applications a year also, with uh, inside the, uh, the, the fertilizers, uh, a blend able to deliver the nutrients in the right moment. So you see the quantity of nitrogen decreasing from 30 to 17, and we can go even lower to 15 to 12, Gram square meter per year, so 120, like a normal wheat, 120, 150 kilo hectare nitrogen. So this is uh, the final picture we produce uh, at the beginning. So you see here the uh, growth pattern and the different solutions. This is subcontinent. This is a typical, uh, you know, suggestion chart where you cross different species in one climate with the different products. Now the names have changed, I guess. Some are still there, some not, I don't know. It's just to show that we were and we are uh, discussing all the time about the uh, ratio. This is the ratio nitrogen potassium, Yeah, you see, to give to the plants in the right moment the most useful nutrients. Uh, Thank you for uh, 